Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's STS-134 Crew News Conference. We'll begin with crew introductions and then take questions. Mark Kelly, a captain in the U.S. Navy, will serve as a commander for this final mission of Space Shuttle Endeavor. Mark was selected to join the astronaut corps in 1996. He has flown on three prior space shuttle missions, STS-108 in 2001, STS-121 in 2006, and STS-124 in 2008. We'll now turn it over to Mark to introduce his crew. Mark. Well, thank you for coming here today. I'm going to introduce my crew in a second. Uh, it's great to be here with them today. Uh, they're a very talented group, and uh, I'm happy to have them on this crew with me. It's a bittersweet privilege to be taking Endeavor on its last flight, delivering the uh, last major piece to the ISS. Um, we'll talk more about that mission and the payloads shortly, but I want to first say a couple words about the recovery of my wife, Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. As her doctors described in her last press conference on March 11th, she's doing remarkably well. She's improving every day, and in the realm of brain injuries, that is uh, very significant and pretty rare. She's starting to walk, uh, talk more, more every day, and she's starting to process some of the tragedy that we all went through in January. She's going through that as we speak. Uh, uh, despite that, she remains in a very good mood. She spends most of her day in therapy, enjoys brief visits from friends and colleagues. She was really happy to see my brother last week uh, after he returned from space. Uh, she gets staff briefings uh, from her staff when they're in town on what's going on with her office in the district and what's going on in Congress. Uh, I see her every morning before I go to work and when I come home from work at the end of, at the end of my day. I've said uh, on a few occasions that I'd like her to attend the launch. She wants to attend. She's been looking forward to this for a long time. As NASA's one, one of NASA's biggest supporters in Congress, you know, she was uh, really looking forward to having the opportunity to be there. And I think there's a pretty good chance that's going to happen. We still don't know for sure, and I'm uh, just awaiting, you know, final approval from her doctors. Um, today, I'd like to talk about STS-134. It's an important mission. Um, we've been training for this flight for over 18 months. Um, I know you guys have a lot of questions about it. I'd like you to respect the fact that this is about STS-134, and it's not about my wife's recovery. Uh, I'll be happy to take those questions about my anything in my personal life. I'll be happy to talk about that, but that's at a later time, and we could uh, coordinate that through, uh, through Gabrielle's office. So before I continue, I want to tell you a little bit about my crew. Sitting to my left is Greg Johnson. Um, Greg strapped me in for my first flight, STS-108, a long time ago. He's a retired colonel in the U.S. Air Force. He's our pilot. He was a pilot on STS-123. He's a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy, Columbia University, and the University of Texas. Um, in the Air Force, he was an F-15E Strike Eagle pilot. He flew in Operation Desert Storm and Southern Watch. Um, I probably passed him in the middle of the night over Iraq a long time ago. <laughs> He's also an Air Force test pilot. Um, to Greg's left is Mike Fink. Mike is a colonel in the U.S. Air Force. He's a graduate of both MIT and Stanford. He flew on Expedition 9 and was the commander of Expedition 18. He's done six Russian spacewalks. He's uh, one of our three spacewalkers for this mission. Uh, on flight day 12 of our flight, Mike is going to su surpass Peggy Whitson as being the American with the most time in space. It'll be somewhere north of uh, 380 days, and that's going to happen on flight day 12. Uh, next to Mike is Roberto Vittori. He's a colonel in the Italian Air Force. He's an ESA astronaut, but he's on a mission for the Italian Space Agency. He's a graduate of the Italian Air Force Academy, uh, the University of Naples, and the University of Perugia. He's also a graduate of the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School, and I first met Roberto when we were both test pilots in uh, Patuxent River, Maryland. Roberto's flown uh, two flights on the Soyuz up to the space station, so this will be his first flight on the space shuttle. Uh, next to Mike is Drew Foistel. Uh, Drew is our lead spacewalker for this mission. 
He flew on STS-125 doing multiple spacewalks for the last repair of the Hubble Space Telescope. Drew's a graduate of Purdue University and also of Queen's University in Ontario and has a PhD in geology. Before he was uh, an astronaut, he worked for Exxon, Exxon Mobil as a geophysicist. Um, MS-4, next to Drew, is Greg Chamatoff. Uh, Greg and I flew together in STS-124, where I closed the hatch on him and nobody showed up for six months <laughs> until he was picked up on uh, STS-126. So he's flown uh, a six-month mission to the ISS. He's a graduate of uh, both Caltech and MIT, has a PhD in aeronautics and astronautics, and I'm um, looking forward to getting the opportunity to fly with Greg Again, he'll be uh, doing a couple spacewalks as well on this mission. STS-134, we're bringing up the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. It's a uh, pretty sophisticated payload. It's been in development for 16 years. It's going to look for antimatter, dark matter, dark energy. Uh, it's a collaboration from 16 different countries with 600 scientists. So we're pretty excited about uh, what this means for science aboard the ISS and, and for, you know, real science on the you know, on the origin of the universe. We're also going to deliver a platform of critical spare parts uh, called ELC-3. It's got um, a bunch of components that can be used on the outside of the space station if we have future failures. So it puts us in a good position for life on station after, uh, after the last space shuttle flight. STS-134 will be the final uh, space shuttle EVA mission. So it's going to be the final time that space shuttle crew members do uh, spacewalks. <clears throat> um, so on this flight, we're going to be doing four of those. It's also the 25th and final flight of Space Shuttle Endeavor. Uh, after we add AMS and ELC-3, I think the space station is going to be about one million pounds in mass. So we have a pretty significant capability on orbit that we're looking forward to using for, you know, 10, 15 years to come, hopefully, maybe even longer than that. So now I'd like to open it up to uh, questions. I'm going to turn it back over to Nicole for that. Thank you, Mark. Um, as a reminder, this uh, briefing is to focus on the 134 mission. As we have a limited time with the crew, you'll be limited to one question each, and please keep them focused on the mission. Uh, we will start with questions here at the Johnson Space Center, and if time permits, we'll take questions from Kennedy Space Center and headquarters. And we'll start at this side uh, with CBS. Bill Harwood. Bill Harwood, CBS for the commander. Uh, the last time we saw you was on February 4th when you said you were going to come back in command. Can you give us a sense of uh, how the training has gone after taking a bit of a layoff? And I need to ask one second question, which is kind of a follow-up from your introductory remarks. You were saying that you'd be happy to chat later down the road, but to go through the representative's office. Is that, is that the way that works as opposed to going through NASA to arrange interviews? Yeah, I think for something that's regard to my personal life, with, which I think most people want to focus on, on my wife in that case, I think it's appropriate to probably go through her office because it concerns her. Um, the training, uh, when I took about three weeks to a month off for the initial part of her recovery, it was actually a pretty good time for that happen because we recently had a launch slip. So when I got back to work, our schedule wasn't really, you know, jammed up in any way. It's been a reasonable training flow. We've completed everything. Ahead of us, we have terminal countdown test a post-insertion sim, two ascent, one entry sim, some STAs, a couple more MBL runs, and then we'll be heading down for, uh, for launch. All right, thank you. Over here. Uh, Mark, uh, this is for you. Greg Dobbs with HDNet Television. Since there was a time when Endeavor was going to go up while your brother was on the crew on station, can you now reveal what pranks, what tricks the two of you as identical <laughs> twins were going to play on everybody else? That's a, that's a, that's a good question. You know, we... We've been asked to do this switch places thing since we were in kindergarten, and we've always resisted it. So we actually did have something set up where when we were closing the hatch, and this would have upset MCC, I think, a little bit, unless they were onto us. But my plan was to change shirts, shave my mustache. He had a fake one. <laughs> I'd get back into the orbiter. They think they, they, you know, somebody would have thought that was him, and I was on the on the ISS. So that was the plan. Is that true? <laughs> All right, over here. Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. I'm going to throw this one to Mike Fink. We got a very thorough briefing from Dr. Ting about alpha magnetic spectrometer. I'm looking for a civilian definition, if you're willing to give that to me. Absolutely. Uh, the universe as we know it, we 
a few years ago, we thought we knew everything, and or, or mostly everything, and uh, we were just uh, trying to trying to get uh, uh, you know a little bit better acquainted and uh, with the universe, and maybe you know nail down a few parameters. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope help us uh, understand the age of the universe. But it also opened up a new uh, Pandora's box. It turns out that 85% of the universe we don't understand. We don't understand why galaxies just don't fly apart. And now, you know, we're, we're, we're all the physicists are really scratching their heads. And uh, we have the really great opportunity. And, and Dr. Ting foresaw this and has worked uh, along with his team for a long, long time. Uh, you know, making an international coalition to go out and find out what's really happening out there. And we're the delivery guys. We're going to take really good care of that one billion dollar plus, uh, or maybe billion euros kind of uh, uh, really precious uh, commodity, this alpha magnetic spectrometer. And it's going to look out there. It's just going to be facing out into the heavens and uh, seeing what it can see. Some of the world's most advanced uh, particle detectors, the ones that they developed at CERN, uh, they were made space flight ready by a, a, a great team. And uh, we're just looking forward to seeing what it, what it shows, what the future holds, what our universe is really about. Thank you. Over here. Marsha Dunn, Associated Press for the Commander. Um, have you found it more difficult than you might have envisioned to focus on your mission this close to flight when you're trying best as you can to split your time between work and, and your family? Uh, I'm not splitting my time. So I'm here during the day or whenever, you know, I'm scheduled for training. but. Uh, no, it's not not difficult to focus. I've been through this. You know, it's my fourth flight, so I'm spending as much time as I would focused on the mission, as if this never even happened to to my wife. Go ahead. Janet Shamlian from NBC News. On that same note, you described being by your wife's side every day during her recovery. So during this mission, how will it be for you to be apart from her for this period of time? It's always difficult. You know, from being, I mean, I think I speak for all of us that it's difficult to be away from home and away from your spouses, but uh, there are people in the military that, you know, deploy for long, much longer periods of time, and expedition crew members like, like Mike and Greg who have spent, you know, Mike has spent over a year in space and Greg six months, so. It's a unique situation. It is. It is. Okay, next. Hi, Clara Moskowitz with Space.com. And for the commander, um, can you talk about the legacy of Endeavor f during its last mission as compared to the other orbiters? Well, you know, I, I, who else has flown on Endeavor here? Box has flown on Endeavor. Taz has flown. So three, three out of six of us have flown on Endeavor. So it's, you know, it's pretty close to, to you know, my heart as it's the first space shuttle I flew on uh, in 2001. So I'm glad it's... You know, the, the one I'm going to fly in last, it's the baby of the fleet. It's uh, coming up on 19 years in service, the 25th flight. 25 is a good round number to end on. Hi, Mike Cronin from The Daily. This is for uh, Commander and Mike Fink. Uh, how does it feel to be the commander of the mission where one of your crew members will set the American record uh, for time and space and for uh, Mike, uh, what does that mean to you to be able to do this with this group of people? Well, for me, it's great to, to do this with Mike. We're classmates, you know, astronaut classmates, you know, coming here in 1996. So I'm happy to be on the flight that he becomes the U.S. record holder. Mike? Yeah, I'd, it was funny because uh, I anticipated this question a, l a little bit, but I hadn't really thought about it too much. I was thinking more of uh, you know my friends here. This is the first time that uh, Drew's going to see the space station you know, after he you know, went up on a on a Hubble space mission, and uh, and uh, Greg Shamatov, 201st uh, guy to do a spacewalk, and and uh, Roberto here. I mean, he's been on the space station, but this is uh, our first shuttle flight, even though we both flew twice on Soyuz, and uh, my. My great test pilot friend here, Box, and and uh, all the great things that he brings to our team, and so, that, so that's really what I've I've thought about more than uh, time because you know this record, it's going to go away. And the Russians, they have uh, you know Sergey Krikalov, 803 days in space, so 380 is not uh, it's not even halfway there yet. I want to say that it's good that people have brought this up because now we can think of some way to commemorate it appropriately. <laughs> <laughs> You know, actually, though, uh, Spanky uh, will have spent more time in space than Endeavor did in her entire career. So, uh, or than the rest of us put together. <laughs>
right, next question, Eric. Yeah, Eric Berger with the Houston Chronicle. Not sure which of the, I know there's four of you that are deal, dealing with the AMS uh, sort of installation, I think on flight day four. One of you maybe could talk about the challenge of moving this $2 billion instrument that has all these detectors in it, is fragile and has spent 17 years in the making and ensuring you get it. What is sort of the trickiest part of that and, and sort of is it with trepidation that you approach that, that task? Box, why don't you take that? We uh, practiced the maneuver yesterday, actually. Uh, two guys in the uh, shuttle will uh, unberth AMS and then uh, bring it to a kind of intermediate handoff position at which time two of us uh, operating the uh, station arm will grab it and install it on the, on the space station. Um, it's going to be a very slow maneuver. It's a very carefully uh, choreographed maneuver. Um, all four of us are working all of it. Uh, so uh, when uh, Roberto uh, is, he's, he's at the helm uh, bringing it out of the shuttle's payload bay. Uh, and uh, we'll be using our station cameras to uh, help him out to, to do that task. And then likewise, when Taz and I are working on the, on the space station arm side, uh, we'll be using their cameras to, to make it work. Uh, there's a series of, of checkpoints along the way uh, where we're keeping each other safe and backing each other up. And then once uh, it's up on top of the uh, truss, uh, we'll attach it and uh, turn it on. Go ahead. Philip Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com. Um, I had a question about the the storm re-rendezvous after undock and, and kind of your roles uh, during that and sort of compare and contrast the rendezvous that you're going to be doing on flight day three with the rendezvous that you're going to be doing on, on uh, post undock. Is, are, do your roles change? I mean, I know, uh, Greg, you're going to be, or Box, you're going to be flying the, the, the fly around, but do you sort of switch roles? After you back, after you do your SEP two burn, and then do the re-rendezvous. Well, let me let me just yeah. say our, our roles for the rendezvous part don't change, but for the storm stuff, I want to let Drew at, answer that question because he's responsible for that yeah, that so, payload. So we can, you know, the way storm is working is uh, the system is has never really been calibrated for what its job is, which is to do this approach to the space station. So initially on the on the first rendezvous, uh, the sensors will be on. I'll be monitoring the software that is uh, is running the device. And uh, the, uh, the ground team will use that information on the initial rendezvous to help calibrate the sensors for um, the, fly, you know, the fly around uh, on the, on when we depart and when we, when we do the re-rendezvous. So um, our roles are identical, as, as Mark pointed out, for the rendezvous and for the fly around and re-rendezvous. We all maintain the same roles. Um, the whole flight crew is really involved in, um, in the, in the re-rendezvous. Uh, if, if we're not actually working sensors or uh, um, you know, actually flying the rendezvous, someone's taking pictures. So, you know, and all of that is part of the, um, the way we're going to do this. Uh, but essentially, um, the storm software is running itself. I do some initialization uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the code to make sure that it's operating properly. And uh, everybody's been trained to some level on how to monitor uh, what the feedback is on the, uh, on the uh, computer screen to know if the, the system's failing. But it's essentially m my job to to really watch what's happening with the software and, and help the ground understand if they don't have the insight that they expect uh, to be able to respond and make sure that the hardware works uh, on the way back in so that ultimately when it's used as a rendezvous device or, or on, a, on a newer vehicle, um, the system would be fully calibrated and they'd have a good understanding of, of how well it's going to perform. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, about a week before your, you take off, uh, NASA Administrator uh, Charlie Bolden is going to announce where Endeavour and the other orbiters are going to go for their retirement. Um, I wonder if, if each or any of you have strong feelings of where it should go, uh, where Endeavour should go. Um, and in a general sense, when they do install Endeavour in a museum after your flight, how do you want your mission to be described on the placard that will describe its last mission? How about Greg down at the end? You want to take that one? Yeah, I got the hard question. Wait for me for the hard question. Uh, you know, uh, Endeavor is kind of a special meaning to me because, as um, Mark mentioned, when he dropped me off and closed the hatch, uh, six months later, um, Endeavor pulled into formation with the space station below while Mike and I were taking pictures of it out the window. And uh, that has to be one of the most, most emotional moments for me in the whole mission was seeing this amazing spaceship come up and pull up to the space station that I knew was going to be my ride home and, and uh, you know, get to go back home to my family after, after an amazing time up there. 
Um, Endeavour was the first uh, shuttle that brought a piece of the space station, you know, to space, uh, connected Node 1 to the FGB, and now it's going to be there for the very last external major hardware that we bring up. So, in a sense, it's bookending the entire construction of the space station. And, uh, you know, that, that's a legacy for the whole space shuttle program, uh, not just for Endeavour, but I think that's, you know, that's the legacy that it leaves behind. All right. Jill Tolk with Bay Area Houston Magazine. Question for Drew. Uh, this is your first flight to station, although of course not your first flight on shuttle. What's been the most challenging part and the most rewarding part to wrap your mind around training for station as opposed to go seeing a telescope instead? Um, well, the most challenging part is uh, trying not to get lost on the space station. Uh, it's quite a bit bigger than Hubble. Hubble was uh, relatively easy in that sense because it was sort of like having uh, some hardware in the trunk of your car. Uh, space station is, uh, there's quite a bit more room to roam out there and, uh, and it is easy to get disoriented because uh, things look very similar when your face is up against uh, the truss. Um, but uh, it's, it's exciting for me. I can't wait to see it. Um, it will be able to cover a lot more distance. Um, not as much, you know, fine motor skills required, I think, for uh, some of the work that we did on Hubble, but certainly some important work uh, that's required for the space station uh, to give it, you know, that uh, long life that uh, we need to keep it in service. And um, I'm just really excited to be able to go outside with, uh, with Greg and, and Mike and, and share some great experiences and get some amazing views of uh, the planet and the space station itself. And, we hope to be able to take some some spectacular photos uh, while we're out there uh, to sort of commemorate, you know, the last um, the last shuttle-based EVAs from the station and get a gr great view of of the space station uh, at its completion. Um, and those pictures are unique that you really can only get uh, as an EVA crew member when you're out on the end of the truss. So uh, it's been exciting and, and fun, and we're looking forward to it. Edge Key with Harvard Journalism. Five of you are fathers. Uh, this is the last shuttle mission currently scheduled for an academic school year. If you could address school children, what fascinates you most about and excites you most about this mission, and what do you see for young people as their legacy? What do you envision for them as the next generation of space explorers? Roberto, can you take that, please? Yeah, Mark, you didn't say that I can only accept questions in Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Or being, being ESA, I can enlarge it to French or German. <laughs> well, this is uh, the last shuttle flight, last flight for Endeavour, but it's my first shuttle flight I'm very excited about. I have three children, and uh, I share with them my excitement for a mission that, despite it is presented as the last one, in my eyes is uh, one of the milestones for transportation of future generation. The shuttle, for me, is nothing else than the, the, the father of anything that will fly in the future at hypersonic speed and uh, will make our world much smaller. So I look with excitement to this mission, and I try to share my excitement to my kids and uh, any other uh, child I have opportunity to talk to. Right. Irene Klotz uh, with Reuters. Um, Mark, thanks for the um, update about your wife. I think she's been on a lot of people's minds. and. Um, Forgive this question, but I guess I'm just curious why you had um, a last-minute change of heart and uh, canceled your round-robin interviews. Um, well, I expected to, to get that question because, I mean, the main reason is because I anticipated that um, I would likely get a lot of questions about her, which I wanted to address just in a statement. And I feel that, you know, pretty much anything about the mission, I can, you know, I can, we can cover right here. So that's, that's basically the reason. All right. Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News, with a question for Greg. Um, the commander on Drew's mission told me that the pilot's doing all the work on launch. Can you tell me what the commander actually does during launch? <laughs> <laughs> the first commander uh, that I flew with, Dom Gorey, also happened to be uh, Mark's uh, first commander. And we used to joke with Dom, we used to call him Gator, because all he did was uh, float around and eat. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, the commander's job uh, is a very complicated job, especially for this flight. Uh, we have a group that has uh, come from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of experience. And when you get 
uh, various uh, experience from different sources, um, it's, it's hard to build that team together to, to do something uh, without a lot of, uh, you know, dissension from the ranks. And so uh, I think Mark's done a great job doing that. You know, we've had a little extra time to build this team, but we have a very, very strong team. And so the commander sets the tone, tone for the mission, and ultimately the commander is responsible for everything that happens on the mission. Now, as a pilot, yeah, I have a lot of fun things to do. I want to make sure that everybody gets fed, that all the, uh, uh, the trash is taken care of, that the toilet operates perfectly. And then for Ascent and Entry uh, and uh, Rendezvous, I'll be backing up Mark along the way. So, um, you know, it's a team effort, but the commander kind of keeps things going in the proper direction, and that's really, I view, as Mark's role. Okay. Max Hoffman with German Broadcaster Deutsche Welle. This is a question for the commander. Um, you've been up there a couple of times on a shuttle. How do you feel about this being definitely the last time up there on a shuttle? Um, so yeah, this is my fourth um, flight to ISS on the space shuttle. It's kind of sad to see the space shuttle retired. It's been an incredible success over a long period of time, and it's it brings a capability that's you know that certainly we're not going to replace with the next vehicle. So it's. It's sad to see it see it go. I think it's probably the right time to to retire the shuttle and move on to something else, so we can get at a low Earth orbit and start to uh, explore the solar system again. So even though it's it's, it's kind of sad, it's exciting to do something new. Hi, Elizabeth Saab with the Daily. Um, Commander Kelly, on your previous flights, you've had the song "A Beautiful Day" to wake up to in the morning. Do you guys have a song that you're gonna take up there with you to wake yourselves up in the morning? Hey, Drew. Uh, um, yeah, Drew. Why don't you take that? Minor surprise. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to talk about wake up songs. Right. We, we but uh, <laughs> can I? Right can I <laughs> we do. We do all have. Uh, we do all have uh, some wake up songs. Some of us have surprise wake up songs. <laughs> if you know what mine is, don't tell me. Um, but everybody has selected a few songs, and we also have um, so winners of a, of a contest, right? That were selected. The people, original composers that wrote songs uh, for the space. Uh, as wake up music, and I believe two of those songs, am I right, Mark? Nicole? Two. Will be played on our mission and last two days. Uh, on the last two days. So we all have music that we have either selected or had selected for us, and then there's the additional, the additional songs. Uh, Jim Oberg over here at NBC. Uh, you have uh, other responsibilities too, of course, but the, besides all these records, record breaking flights and last flights, and one of them is as, as the point of, of the spear of a much bigger team. People you're working with are facing some other tensions of their own. How have you, in terms of, of, of the near future of their careers, how have you been working with, with your people who support you to encourage them and, and help them as, keep their, their heads in the game too? Well, a uh, training for a shuttle mission is very, uh, very planned out over a long period of time. So there's, um, you know, there's stuff that, uh, that we do to try to support our team. You know, we have social events with them. Um, we take trips to Florida on occasion to support the, the great group of folks there that processes the vehicle, gets, gets it ready for launch. We've got a large team of people in mission control. And as, as you said, Jim, you know, some of those folks are going to be, they're going to be out of work here shortly. Um, they're all professionals. I mean, we're, we're certainly very sympathetic and um, we talk to those folks every day. You know, I had a conversation with Lisa Martinetti two days ago who's worked here for um, I think more than 19 years, and you know she's dedicated her life to 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 spaceflight, and she's got a very positive outlook on it as 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 do other people. And there'll be opportunities out there. The the workforce here is an incredibly talented group of people, and I'm sure they're gonna the folks that decide to maybe go in another uh, another direction are gonna do some great things. So. With that, we're going to switch over to Kennedy Space Center, where we have two reporters. Hi, this is Michelle Spitzer with Florida Today. Can some or all of you talk about what it means to be part of Endeavor's final flight? And will any of you be bringing up any trinkets to commemorate this last flight? Anything uh, to remind you of your family while you're up there? Greg, why don't you, why don't you take that? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I'm taking a couple of things for uh, uh, my kids. Um, I have two kids that are six years old, uh, a girl and a boy, and um, they 
they were very young when I had my, was on my last flight, so um, they they didn't necessarily understand exactly what was going on. And this time they have a much better idea. So um, I've got a I've got a it's kind of funny. I've got a, a little seal, but the, but uh, my daughter named the seal porcupine. So it's porcupine <laughs> that's going up, and another little penguin my son wanted me to bring named Zach. Um, and I've got uh, some other things, you know, for different organizations that I that I've been a part of. The uh, Boy Scouts of America. They they made a patch special for our flight um, that I'm I'll be carrying, and uh, a few other special things like that. Uh, Todd Halverson of Florida today. Um, Mark, you kind of touched on this earlier, but I was I was wondering if you could. Um, Give us your thoughts on how long it'll be until there is another uh, vehicle, space vehicle, that has all the capabilities that the uh, space shuttle has. Well, the, you know, the space shuttle can take a very large payload into orbit. It can support multiple spacewalks, has a robotic arm capability. It can retrieve satellites. It can dock to a space station. Uh, it can carry a crew of seven astronauts. Uh, so we don't have anything on the drawing board that'll, that'll do that. But, you know, that, or, that vehicle was designed to work in low Earth orbit. Our next vehicle is going to be designed to not only get people to and from the space station, but to also possibly go on to, to the moon, maybe be used in an architecture that would possibly get us to Mars at some point. So, you know, I... I I think it's impossible for me or anybody else to say when we would build a vehicle that would have the same capabilities as a space shuttle. I think it's, uh, it's certainly a long way off. Okay, we're turning back here to the Johnson Space Center. Irene Klotz with Reuters. Um, I'm curious if any of you um, have any strong feelings, yay or nay, about um, a possible career um, with one of the commercial space companies as an astronaut or some position um, outside outside of the, uh, the government agency. Anybody want to take that, Spanky? Sure. Uh, like Mark said, there's uh, going to be some opportunities out there. And, uh, and there, each and every one of us who are professional astronauts are, 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 are thinking, hey, what, what does the future hold? And uh, the commercial space, is, uh, as it progresses, as it matures, is uh, going to start sending up you know, other astronauts who aren't NASA astronauts. And uh, and open up a, a whole new, if you pardon the the phrase, frontier, uh, for us to go explore. And I think each and every one of us has have, have thought about that. Say, hey, will that fit for me? Will that fit with my family? Uh, it may be a little more dangerous. May be more lucrative. It may be the same same kind of job and just as exciting as what we're doing now. It may be more exciting. Um, you know, we it's it's unknown. But it's a. Uh, I think the original pilots who were flying airplanes were all military pilots. And then we opened up, you know, in the 1920s, you know, to commercial aviation, and all of a sudden we had a whole bunch of pilots. And I'm looking forward to the day where we have, you know, a whole bunch of astronauts, and uh, that people barely remember the guys that flew for 380 days, or barely remember the 201st astronaut to take a spacewalk, because that's what we're that's what we're doing. And the, and hoping that's a big American industry out there providing jobs for all of us. We're going to need our training teams, and we're trained by the best. So hopefully this opens up a new opportunity for not just us uh, NASA types, but uh, for the population at large. Won't that be exciting? Okay, and we have time for one last question here over on the left. Oh. It's Bill Harwood again for Scott. I w I'm Scott. Uh, <laughs> well, you do look like your brother. <laughs> we're, we're not allowed to do that anymore. <laughs> okay, Next well. question. <laughs> okay, somebody else gets that last question. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you do look alike, so I guess I get to be forgiven for that. Uh, I just was revisiting my first question. I was asking, I asked you about training when you came back into this flow, and I, I was, I guess, what I was wondering was really was not not what you had actually done simulation-wise, but um, you know, for all the obvious reasons, you've had a more challenging flow than most commanders, just because of distractions. I'll use that word better than anything else. Mm -hmm. How has that been for you? I mean, I know that you guys compartmentalize. You said that before as a military man, uh, but but it does seem like a more challenging flow for all of those reasons for you personally. Uh, and it does reflect on 134. How, how has that gone for you in terms of dealing with all that? Well, I think it would have been really challenging if this was my first shuttle flight or if it was my even my first flight as the commander of the space shuttle. 
But just coming off of uh, doing this with STS-124, which is a very complicated mission, you know, very, uh, you know, sophisticated payload to bring it up to the Japanese laboratory, you know, having that experience certainly makes it um, very manageable to be able to handle what's going on in my personal life and focusing on the mission. I mean, I've, um, you know, I've given this mission everything I would have if uh, the events of January 8th did not happen. So I'm very focused. We're very prepared as a crew. Uh, we've got a little bit more training to go. Uh, when we get back from terminal countdown tests next Friday, we basically have one full week here uh, in the office and doing some training. And then the following week, we go into quarantine. So we're getting pretty close to the end, and uh, we're, ready to, we're ready to do this and excited about it. So, thank All you. Right. With that, that wraps up our briefing. A reminder, you can find out more about the STS-134 mission on our NASA website at www.nasa.gov shuttle. Thank you.